Okay, so we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone to our first webinar of 2018. I hope you all had a really good break and are ready to get stuck into hearing about strategies to recruit and retain volunteers in your centre. My name's Carly Hansen. I'm the Sector Development Officer at Community Legal Centres Queensland and shortly I'll introduce our speaker. So firstly, I'll just make sure that everyone can hear me. So if you can press the button that looks like a hand on your GoToWebinar control panel, we'll see those hands go up at our end and know that everything's working. Okay, so that seems to be working, which is fabulous. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're holding this webinar today. So in Brisbane, they are the Turrbal and the Yagara people. I wish to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islands continue to play in our society. As this webinar is being viewed by people across Queensland and Australia, I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land throughout the country um, and everyone who is joining us today as well. So here with us today, we have Michelle Lindley from Volunteering Queensland, and she'll be sharing her insights about how you in a CLC can successfully recruit and retain skilled and volunteer, uh, student volunteers, I should say, and how to ensure your volunteers and your centre both receive a really rewarding experience. So Michelle's PowerPoints have been emailed out to everyone and are also available to download on the control panel um, on your screen there under handouts. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Michelle. Thanks, Michelle. Hi, thank you, Carly, and welcome everybody. Um, my, as you heard, my name is Michelle Lindley. I'm the Sector Development Manager here at Volunteering Queensland. Um, Likewise, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners, uh, custodians of this land we share and pay respect to their elders past and present and the emerging leaders of tomorrow. Firstly, I'd just like to introduce Volunteering Queensland for those who aren't aware of us. Uh, we are the peak body for volunteering in Queensland. Uh, we've been around since 1983 um, servicing the volunteer sector, which actually covers a whole range of different sectors. There's volunteers in, um, all over the place. Um, we assist volunteering, uh, volunteer involving organisations like yourselves to um, find out what the current trends are and improve how you're doing uh, things or just to connect with others. We also help volunteers um, source volunteer opportunities through our help desk and our database that we have online. And we um, have a training and development um, which I head up and that's an, an RTO doing accredited training as well as professional development workshops and presentations. Um, and we have a lot of big campaigns we've been involved with over the year from Chogham to Goodwill Games and G20 uh, and we're not doing com games, we're taking a breather from that one. Um, but we also have some major campaigns that we run with National Volunteer Week and Student Volunteer Week. And we head up the emergency volunteering arm. So when there are disasters and emergent, um, emergencies in Queensland and in other states, we step up and help recruit and deploy the spontaneous volunteers in partnership with key uh, or local organisations and councils. So there you go, there's a snapshot of who we are and everything we do. And as you can see, we're a very small little band of folk doing it all. I'm gonna start by uh, bringing you all into the fundamental definition of what volunteering is. It is time willingly given for the common good and without financial gain. That's the defining elements of saying that somebody is volunteering. Something that changed about this definition recently was that they took out the words in a not-for-profit organisation and that was just an acceptance of a new trend that is around with volunteering and that's called informal volunteering and we'll look at that a bit later. <clears throat> but, but we have to acknowledge that people um, do volunteer in settings that aren't within a not-for-profit organisation. So I'd like to ask all of you, who actually volunteers? Who in their own time 
gives their time willingly for no financial gain and for the common good. What I want you to think about here is if you volunteer in a setting with an organisation, is that's what's coming to your mind? I want you to now stop and think about if you go for a walk with your dog and you pick up rubbish, or if you somebody moves into the neighbourhood uh, and you help them out, or so, an elderly neighbour needs their garden done and you help them out, that's actually volunteering. It's informal volunteering, which is one of the biggest trends that has now been captured that we that we have to recognise. Uh, in this field. So if you go and pick up rubbish, you're helping out the environment, you don't need to be part of an environmental not-for-profit group to be doing something for the common good and hence why we had to change that definition. And there's also an acknowledgement that volunteering um, changes you as much as it changes the organisation or the clients you're working with. So for those of you that volunteer, you're part of 19% of our population. In the State of Volunteering report in 2016, the thing that people said they improved the most with, with volunteering was patience. So I think volunteering actually should be made compulsory for all uh, students and all adults that are in a workplace um, just to improve our patience. The the Queensland statistics do align a lot with the national ones, but they, we also need to understand that there's another a, a number of other Queensland and Australian-based surveys on volunteering work um, with substantially different results compared to these census results. Volunteer rates in other surveys estimated it to be at least double that of what these stats are saying. So basically saying that there's about 40% of people actually volunteer. The difference of this is usually due to the methodology of the surveys. So the census uses a self-completion questionnaire where other surveys use face-to-face -face conversations and can actually dig a bit deeper and get a much more accurate response. Um, but let's just claim the greater and be glad that it is more likely like 40% of the people who volunteer. And the reason for that is when you have those conversations and dig deeper in the other surveys, they do find out that people are actually informally volunteering and they just start recognising it. The other trend to keep in mind is that people may not, new populations that are coming into Australia may not say they volunteer, but when you ask them, they actually do informally volunteer. They just think of it as helping out their mob or helping out their people, um, but the, the essence of it is the same. So let's look at some of the ways that we see people volunteering now. As we mentioned, informal volunteering takes place outside the context of a formal organisation uh, and can also include mentoring and coaching and things like that. <clears throat> Episodic volunteering is where volunteers are engaged in a one-off or short-term capacity that may be based on their time available, such as over holidays or it may be a big event. They may actually be serial volunteers and they volunteer on and off over time. We see this um, with those big sporting events. So we have, you know, the Commonwealth Games will see an array of volunteers that will get a new shirt to replace the one that they got and um, from Sydney Olympics, which should have been retired by now, but there are still people wearing them. Um, but episodic volunteering also means projects. So this is really the current flavour of volunteering. People want to come in and they want to be part of something and they want to be want to know when it's going to start, what they're going to do and when it's going to end. And this is really where volunteering organisations have to move to, is saying that you're not going to get somebody there for the term of their natural life. You're actually just going to get them there for a short time. <clears throat> Corporate volunteering which you would all be aware of, is uh, where paid employees are giving their work time to an organisation. This is where skilled volunteering exists as well um, and they're using their expertise, but it is still short-term volunteering, um, be it uh, individually or as a group. Virtual volunteering is uh, another one that's ripe and is growing. And this is not just about the young techno savvy people doing graphic, 
design and um, computer-based work. It's also about saying how do we start to get volunteers that are, are displaced or, or geographically in different areas but connect them so that they can get the work done. And this can be through conferencing, it can be through uh, online meetings and so forth. But they can still help out, it's just done in a virtual capacity. Spontaneous volunteering is that emergency and disaster stuff most commonly. Uh, it's reactionary to an, emer uh, a, an incident that's occurring. <clears throat> I probably just need to say the words mud army and you understand what I mean by spontaneous volunteering. Family volunteering is becoming a trend uh, and especially in the vacation world and tourism world. So people will take uh, holidays with their family and they will introduce them to uh, a, a volunteering opportunity uh, around the world or nearby in homes. Unfortunately in Australia it's more likely to be overseas than helping out in Australia where it's needed. But this can also mean that organisations can look at the generations that are within their own capture market. So if you do have uh, an older person volunteering, they actually may have a son or a grandchild that could also be helping out in, an organ in your organisation. And there's a, lot, a greater level of commitment and a lot more reward for them as volunteers. The, another way um, for skilled volunteering is that pathways volunteering and that's where um, people are sp doing specific volunteering that will assist them in their studies or with their professional development would work and this is probably where the majority of your um, volunteers come from. All of these have a different type of need and a different type of consideration um, and it or, and you need to also consider, well, how can we set up our program that we're capturing all of these opportunities to get some really good, valuable help from people and give them an experience that they value as well. So let's just take a moment to think about the volunteers within your service. Which category do you think they fit in with the best? Am I right in thinking that the corporate volunteers and the, and the pathway volunteers are your major market? So you may actually have some episodic ones, you may, yep, some virtual ones as well that help out with little things. And consider, uh, sometimes it's about uh, considering what your organisation is doing and other opportunities you can, you can give to volunteers instead of just your core tasks that you know you get them in for. That's great to see that there are a few there but yeah definitely it's really around your pathways volunteers, your students and your skilled professionals that are doing it because they need to acquire the time and the expertise and the experience. Cool. So now you know what they are, they're pathway volunteers. They're also episodic volunteers, true. That's just come up, that, that's very true. They're episodic because they do come in uh, for a set amount of time and that time is often dictated to them by their requirements. So I wanted to spend some time first looking at, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, looking at the back end of volunteer programs. Um, this is about looking at t um, taking your eyes off the volunteer themselves because it's not just all about them, it's also about what's behind your office doors. We'll look at the volunteer program as a whole through the lens of the National Standards for Volunteer Involvement. So this starts to look at the parts that make and break the experience of a volunteer in an organisation. Has anyone heard of the National Standards for Volunteer Involvement? So, oh, I've skipped screens here. The National Standards for Volunteer Involvement came out in uh, 2015 after a lot of consultation across the nation uh, and they cover these eight different areas. 
these are really a guide for organisations to look at the many aspects of their operation that affect a volunteer and their involvement. These are not compliance standards, they're not prescriptive, they're more a guide to enable you to establish good practice according to what you decide is important and how you're going to operate your program. So as you can see, it goes through a whole range of areas starting from the leadership and management of the organisation itself and how volunteers are seen and the culture that they have developed around um, the volunteers' involvement. It goes through to um, the roles, how they're recruited and supported and recognised through to how you continually look, you look at it and make sure that you're trying to improve it. We're going to do a bit of an activity and just look at <clears throat> bit of the gap analysis. So part of the training we do around national standards, we do do a gap analysis on organisations. But if you see this, you'll actually see, um, I've taken out just some of the standards um, and put them, um, put them here. The way you do that analysis, just to say, well, do you think your organisation has met these, uh, partially met them or not met them at all? So have a look at your organisation organisation and see how do you think you would fare when we look at just these two snippets of these two standards on leadership and management. So are there policies and procedures uh, that apply to volunteers and are they communicated and understood and implemented by all relevant staff across the organisation? Take note here, this is saying all staff that are relevant, not just the volunteer coordinator down to the recruitment and selection, are, they, are volunteers actually selected on their interest and knowledge and skills and um, it's all still consistent with the legislation. But is the process, um, does the pro screening process also help maintain um, the safety and security of the users, employers, volunteers and the organisation? So, it's one thing to say we're going to get volunteers and push them through, but you need to actually take the time to say, are we doing everything in the best interest of the volunteer as well as the organisation? So when we look at the, through this lens of the national standards, one of the things, one of the tasks that you can do to help better meet the standards is to give them a relevant and valid job description. So I'm going to put these standards back up. Now, when you look at the, when you supply a volunteer with a valid relevant job description, here's the many ways that you've addressed issues or um, considerations in the national standards. So if they've got a job description, they're going to have a meaningful and appropriate roles and they're going to in, in contribute to the organisation organisation's purpose. They're also, the recruitment is planned, um, they understand their role, they're safe because they know what their processes are and where the boundaries are and they actually have some recognition of the work they're going to be doing and that's really important that they're not just coming in and feeling like they're free manpower, that they see the valued impact that they make. So even though there is a lot in all of the standards, just by making one change or one improvement, you actually start to, to hit a whole lot of um, aspects there. You improve, get towards that best practice. The other thing that's um, often overlooked but is just as important uh, with the recruitment of volunteers is understanding that there are some rights and responsibilities of volunteers. These are not legislated uh, because the rights of what volunteers are addressed by a range of legislation but they're really not covered by any award or workplace agreement. The, uh, the recognised volunteer rights and responsibilities are really just best practice that's been formulated um, nationally and these are available on our website and Volunteering Australia's and you can modify these so that they suit your environment, but I would strongly suggest that these become part of the package that every new volunteer gets. As you can see there that they are told what their rights are and you should ensure that your organisation is addressing all of these. The, red, um, the, the big elephant in the room in regards to volunteer rights is the line be reimbursed for out-of-pocket expenses 
and this is one that should be addressed. If it is an organisational expense, the volunteer should be uh, able and know the process to get reimbursed for it. Uh, and the, the boundaries of what can be reimbursed uh, should be clearly stated in induction. And with a group the size of this, I would hasten to guess that somebody has come across an issue with somebody expecting to or wishing to be paid for something that they have um, expended on to do their volunteer work. So the flip side of that is the volunteer responsibilities. So while they may not have a formal contract with the organisation, just as the organisation must ensure that the volunteer rights are upheld, they should fulfil their responsibilities to the organisation as a volunteer and as a part of that organisation. So they should follow the policies, respect the privacy and confidentiality of the organisation, um, carry out their duties in agreed time and be dependable, work the hours agreed and so forth. You can see why these become a really strong um, document to give to somebody up front and you're able to then performance manage them off the back of these if it comes to a situation where you do need to performance manage a volunteer. If you haven't given them these boundaries and, and these expectations prior, it's really difficult to come back at that. Okay, so that's the end of part one.